Welcome to the Threat Show, powered by Fletch. You know, most companies get a little bit freaked out about layoffs, but if you have to do them, you need to be very, I wouldn't say brutal or vicious about it, but you need to make the right cuts for the right reasons and cut costs. Right. This is an opportunity for vendors to become much better at what they do. Welcome to the Threat Show. My name is Darren Kinland, and with me today we have Chris Wilder, a senior analyst and research director over at Tag Cyber. Welcome, Chris. Hi there. It's good to be back. Likewise. Before we run through the threats, the latter half of our segment is going to cover how security teams operate in a bearish economy. We've had so many different tech layoffs and downturns recently. You know, what do you heads of security or CISOs think about that and how does that affect their strategic planning for 2023. But before we go into that, let's do the burndown of this week's threats. We have a number of different vulnerabilities, some wide reaching and some specific vulnerabilities focused on small, medium sized businesses, as well as yet another supply chain attack against Python repositories. Surprise, surprise. Is this kind of what you were expecting for the the second week of January, Chris, or is this kind of not aligned with your expectations? No, I just sometimes I feel like whenever whenever I look at these, I feel like it's Groundhog Day. And um, <laughs> yeah. you know, I know the I know the bad actors, you know, change their TTPs and move around, and you know, they're very elusive. But you know, I think that uh, these are all very much in line with a lot of the same themes and a lot of the same attack attack vectors that the bad the bad actors, especially those out of Russia and uh, Iran, are really coming after. So yeah, not not a big surprise. That's fair. So, you know, what's made headlines, I think, to start was there was a number of, I believe, cryptocurrency developers who actually had their crypto wallets stolen and they were kind of scratching their heads. How could this happen? What was the method used to compromise their system? And it turns out, surprise, surprise, there was a vulnerability within Google Chrome that kind of facilitated this type of information theft. It's pretty nasty. Thankfully, there is a patch available, but this emphasizes the need that you don't really want to have your your digital wallet, your cryptocurrency wallet on your main computer system all the time, just because these sorts of issues crop up so frequently nowadays and they're being used and abused for thefts of millions of dollars. It's unclear as to whether or not this will be the last one, honestly. But with Chrome being such a big target these days, it's um, only a matter of time. Like we were saying in kind of the prep to this, you know, I'm really kind of sick. Of, I'm tired of hearing about these these Chromium vulnerabilities. It's we've, it, They seem to be just popping up everywhere. Not surprising be just because of the fact that you're right, Chrome is, Chrome is a, almost the de facto browser that most most people actually in the tech world want to use. The interesting thing about this, and, and I had I've had several calls this week with guys like Talon and Island who of what you do, they do secure browsers built mm-hmm. on Chromium. Their business is actually starting to go up because organizations are they realize that the browser is the number one used tool within an organization. Yeah. And so their business is going way up. On the other side of that are the more the hardware-based browser isolation guys like Garrison, the UK, they used to be almost exclusively used for cross-domain secure mm-hmm. environments, really right. very, very secure. Uh, every three-letter agency is, is is a customer of theirs. And so they're starting to get a lot of interest, especially from very regulated marketplaces, because they're seeing these vulnerabilities and these attack vectors coming from the browser that they they're really trying to, to uh, you know build the garrison around the organization, and so you're seeing tales of two cities. But you know, Island is you know Banks use Island, especially dealing with boards, can't cut and paste. It's you know very it's not right. different from you know using a Chrome browser. But then you've got the garrison side of it, which is effectively a skiff on your secure compartmentalized information facility on your laptop. So right, we'll see. I think I think the two will merge, and I think it'll be. We'll meet in the middle somewhere, be a happy medium. Yeah, this is like the new version of thin clients for 2023. Yeah, yeah. we can go to VDI or reverse proxy. So, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. Moving on, the other vulnerability that was discovered recently was actually a very popular vulnerability against a web hosting platform used by many different small, medium-sized businesses called Web Control Panel. So if you're still doing any of your existing web hosting, maybe either on-prem or in a SaaS platform, you definitely want to pay attention to this particular vulnerability and get it patched ASAP. Thankfully, there is a patch available, but the problem really is that not too many organizations are even aware that this vulnerability exists. Even since October, it's still a major target by a lot of different bad actors, unfortunately. That's one of the challenges that that we run into, especially with the SMB and SME world is they just don't know. You know, they assume WordPress is is secure. And so <laughs> they continue to d- develop on that. And I, you're right, I think, but I think it, it behooves the service providers to really kind of drive that communication and they need to do a better job with that and, you know, to avoid things like this. But you're absolutely right. I think that probably 9.5 out of 10 of their customers don't even, don't even realize that they are vulnerable in that regard. You'd think that a mid-scale ISP that's doing hosting for mm-hmm. these small, medium-sized businesses, they might have to, as part of their business model, just do regular vulnerability scanning of web servers yeah. to see if this exists, just because it's it's not getting addressed by the end firms at all until something bad happens, right? Until it gets compromised, until data is lost. At that point, it's it's a big deal. It's a big problem. I saw this a lot in small, small to mid-sized municipalities, you know, that really don't have an IT team or anything like that, but they need to have a website and they need to communicate. They're massive targets. And there was a ransomware attack a couple of years ago that took out 75% of Texas government <laughs> agencies. And wow. there was a massive ransomware attack. And most of, you know, most of these towns in Texas, they're small, they don't have an IT staff. So they outsource everything, and there's really only two or three CMS guys, the content management system guys, that actually cater to municipalities. And I'm getting on a soapbox about service providers have a responsibility and they need to fix it. And you know, I, I hopefully CWT, CWP control will, will uh, that's a mouthful, will do the right thing. There's like a fine line here with a shared security model, right? Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't expect a hosting provider for small, medium-sized businesses to necessarily scan for every vulnerability, but for critical ones like this, uh, you know, exactly. Similarly, with our next vulnerability, this is actually with a product that focuses on customer relationships management software called Sugar CRM. Again, that small, medium-sized businesses use. Unfortunately, it also has a pretty nasty vulnerability that's currently being exploited in the wild. So for any, again, any small, medium-sized business that's hosting their own CRM and they might be using this as a tool for their business, they definitely need to to patch and update this as soon as possible. Uh, Thankfully, there is a patch available. However, not everyone is is applying the patch, unfortunately. In terms of CRM and those types of critical applications within an organization, especially small business, we, we don't recommend hosting it yourself. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's a lot of folks out there that I think Sugar CRM does have a SaaS based platform. They do. Yeah. And so just avoid all of that as much as quickly as you can. Move, you know, move as much as you can to the cloud. You know, just look at the uh, vulnerability of Rackspace with their hosted exchange. You know, all those exchange servers that they had, I think they had somewhere in the neighborhood about three or 400 customers that were out for four or five days on the email side. The only thing Rackspace could do was pay for the migration to Office 365. It just took them forever. And so this is this is just another example of, you know, as much as you can, put that put that onus back on the cloud provider and, you know, make sure that, you know, they take care of the vulnerabilities, not you. Yeah, but, you know, you bring up a really good point, Chris, which is if you're deciding whether or not to go with a SaaS or a entirely hosted model yourself, security needs to be part of that calculation, right? It might be cheaper to to host it on in your own cloud, in your own infrastructure, but maybe it's cheaper because you're not factoring in the security costs. So it's, it's a pretty big factor. When it impacts your business, it could, it could really disrupt the bottom line. Yeah. And a lot, you know, a lot of these small mid-sized enterprises don't have security practices or security people. Usually security is done by 
you know, I call them accidental CISOs because, you know, they're an IT guy that got the job or gal that they needed, they needed some reason to have security, whether it's compliance or, you know, some, you know, they've been hacked in the past or, or whatever. But, you know, a lot of times these accidental CISOs are the cousin of the CEO who got a computer science degree a year ago from DeVry, they're, they're all of a sudden they're in charge of the entire IT and security organization. They don't think proactively like that. And this, this is why I, I'm kind of going back to my beating my point, you know, hosting as much as you possibly can as a small to mid-sized enterprise and work with MSPs and MSSPs to help patch and update and, you know, deal with all these different vulnerabilities because it's darn near impossible to keep up with any of it. Absolutely. Last but not least, there's a new set of malicious packages on the Python repository that was discovered recently. Specifically, it was discovered that there was a, a different type of malware used for masquerading as these three common Python packages that mm-hmm. were likely used by most Python dev shops. What's interesting, I think, about this particular phase of this sort of effort is the underlying malware whack attack was actually traced back to Android banking Trojans. So if we assume for a second that the malware author, you know, is the only one who has control over that code, it seems like they've switched tactics and have gone after instead of banking credentials on Android devices, they've now gone, decided to use the same malware to deploy against supply chain systems and go after sensitive workloads in the cloud. Of all the enterprise CISOs that we work with, and and mostly a lot of the big larger vendors too, they, supply chain attacks are their biggest fear right now. Because number one, it's hard. It's very difficult to control what your third parties are doing. You know, the, your partners and supply chain partners and OEMs and those types of things. It's very difficult for these guys to understand what they're doing and are their security controls as good as yours. And so that's that's one of the biggest challenges. But they see API and supply chain attacks as the, are the two big, the big scaries. And the other, the other thing about this is this finally gets Sentinel one off the hit list <laughs> for, the, for, the, for the exact same <laughs> the exact same vulnerability. I think I think the bad guys have found a, an interesting way to adjust their their attacks and and how they go after these systems, and they're just they're just pushing pushing buttons now. So, right, the speed at which this particular tactic and focus is ramped up is remarkable. Right, yeah. you know, it's now kind of opening the floodgates to. My gosh, a whole bunch of other bad actors are going to start polluting package repos in all the major languages using the same techniques because, hey, it's working, clearly. Same thing with all the other repos, too, especially there's a lot of dirty code out there. So, And, and all, sadly, a lot of the dirty code is is put out there by by developers that don't mean to put dirty code out there. They're just they're just trying to give back to the community. And that's, you know, guys like Get Guardian who are out there to kind of do the credentials and secret scanning in the different repositories are we think that's that's an incredibly important arsenal to have in your especially if you're you know if you have DevOps or a CI C D. It's becoming a little bit more difficult. If you want to dive deeper into this week's trending threats, be sure to check out the interactive Fletch newsletter and Trending Threats app to see all the stories we talked about and more. Let's pivot a little bit. So we've had a number of rounds of layoffs in the tech industry. I think most recently Microsoft announced that they were going to lay off, what, 10,000 additional workers? Everyone's talking about how is this the beginnings of a recession or not, you know, from a security leader's perspective, whether or not you're a CISO or head of security, what are some of the thoughts that kind of run around the minds of of those folks and how they're thinking about ultimately 2023 planning? It's interesting because this is our phones have been lighting up about this because it is it is budget season trying to figure out what their spend is going to be. And Inferior analysts to myself <laughs> are suggesting they're saying it's gonna it's looking like it's gonna be about a 30% decrease in budgets. Wow. Our general just insight into this, we we think it's actually gonna remain flat. That's not gonna mm-hmm. go up or down. 
I think what's happening is there people are starting to consolidate a lot of their systems internally just to get more effectiveness and get a broader set of functionality as opposed to, you know, these very point solutions. But you'll see, you'll see some of the bigger guys. I think Wiz is one that you know that's that's benefiting from a lot of this. So a lot of the big guys like Fortinet and Palo, they'll they'll benefit from this downturn. That's going to be tough for vendors. It's going to be very tough for vendors because it's, you know, you've got to kind of make a Sophie's choice whether, you know, you want to go with an XDR solution or an MDR solution. It's kind of right. or you want to go with this this massive threat intelligence platform or do we have what we need, you know, using Maltigo and, and something else, <laughs> whatever it is. But, you know, I think you're going to see a lot of cost cutting in, in, in areas where there are going to be tend to be a lot more reactive solutions as opposed to proactive I think on the on the the vendor side, you know, we're I know that there's a lot of trials and tribulations, a lot of companies out there right now that we run into that are they're struggling. They're already struggling because they're not getting, like I said, the big guys are getting all the attention now. So they're struggling to to kind of figure their way in the world because I'm not saying venture capital is dried up or anything like that. It's not time to panic, but mm-hmm. it's the vendors need to be better at what they do as opposed to a bunch of guys from the 8200 IDF division in Israel <laughs> gets together and start a company and they get a billion dollar valuation and $400 million. It's just, just right. because of their last job. And so that stopped. I think the unicorn phenomenon has really stopped. It's slowing down. And so companies right now are, are have got to be better at fundraising. They've got to be better at communicating what they do both internally and externally. If you have to do layoffs, go fast, go deep. You know, most companies a bit, get a little bit freaked out about layoffs, but if you have to do them, you need to, you need to be very, um, I wouldn't say brutal or vicious about it, but you need to make the right cuts for the right reasons and cut costs. Right. So just, right. but like I said, it's just, you've got it. This is an opportunity for vendors to become much better at what they do. And, you know, they're going to have to answer series A questions when they're going for a seed round. It's, it's mm-hmm. that's, that kind of thing. So you have to have right. fundamentals. I'm really excited for this, to, you know, as an analyst, because we do 800 briefings a year and a lot of them, they just all just blend together. Well, we hear the same story over and over and over again. You could replace this logo with this message and you, know, you wouldn't miss a beat. So right. like I, said, I think this is going to be a renaissance for companies to really get their acts together and really focus on telling a story and, and telling why people want, need to buy it and why them. And and, and they, you're, you're going to get more realistic valuations, I hope. That was an opportunity. <laughs> in, in some ways, it, it kind of reminds me of the time period of 2008, right? When mm-hmm. there was that last major downturn and it was a pivotal year for a lot of companies that were that were looking to grow. This isn't the first time, it probably won't be the last that we're experiencing this sort of cycle. But yeah. I can imagine it's it's probably difficult for security leaders who may have to deal with some sort of rounds of layoffs within the larger larger business, the larger company. And if they've architected their security hiring strategy to be, let's say, a percentage of the total amount of employees, right? <laughs> At yeah. some point, they won't necessarily be sheltered from those cuts. And it's a matter of, okay, from a security operations or a security perspective, what functions are you willing to let go or defer for a quarter or two as part of this effort? That's that's a hard conversation. It's interesting. I mean, if you've if you've insourced a number of your security functions, would you know using external consultants, external contractors be attractive at a time like this? Is you know, kind of shoring up those functions at least so that you're doing some amount of work in that area? Or from your perspective, is it um, very depending upon what the security function is, you know, compliance versus security operations versus yeah. some other area? I, I'm a huge believer that no organization should build their own sock. I think <laughs> Fair enough. I, I think that's something that needs to be outsourced. And the reason why I say this is, you know, an outsourced SOC provider, especially if they're all, you know, tier one through tier four, they are really, really good at keeping their employees engaged, trained. They know they see all these different threats because they can see the bigger, broader picture. And this is what they do. They, there's a lot of collective intelligence and knowledge there that, you know, you, you don't get when you build your own SOC and you have to train your own employees and you have to pay them. And then 
you get somebody tier one certified and all of a sudden next thing you know they're they're on to the next company mm-hmm. so the investment is is better i think if you outsource to there's some really great sock providers out there that just do this guys like cerebro out of out mm-hmm. of television they're amazing and that's not an endorsement i'm just saying they're really good yeah and 8200 imagine that but the other side of that too i think with GRC and, and compliance and things like that. That's something I think is, is can still remain a hybrid because, you know, who knows your organization and your supply chain better than on the inside, mm-hmm. but you know, putting the tools in place, that's going to be more difficult. I think as security practitioners, we're our own worst enemies because we just don't communicate well. Mm. And we don't, we don't ask succinctly for what we need and why and how we tend to be like on the backs of these, you know, these black walls, these are our offices you know, we work in a closet in the dark and nobody really comes to talk to us because we're the security guys. We don't do ourselves any justice. And so what when we see companies, that the first thing they do are go and fire their security team and let IT take care of it. To me, that just says that they most of the time it's a security teams or the CISO's problem for not being able to communicate all the value and the tangibility of, of what we do as opposed to, the, as opposed to us talking about intangibles. They only come to us when they get hit. When we get, right. when they get breached, they yeah, the yeah, everybody starts screaming. And but if you don't get breached, it must be everything's okay. We don't need security. Right. So. It's it's that's a very hard problem. You know, measuring right. security is is hard <clears throat> enough, but translating the value of security to the larger business is yeah. monumentally difficult. Right. But it's critical, especially at a time like this where there's cost cutting and belt tightening, right? Because if leaders don't understand this value, well, then security is not going to be immune to these sorts of downsizes. It's it's a difficult yeah. situation. Yeah, most, yeah, like I said, most of these guys don't know what to measure. Um, I, I don't want to plug tag, but we actually, our last quarter that we did, we wrote a very, very exhaustive, it's free on our website at tag-cyber.com. Uh, you can go download it. It's about 200 pages of measuring cybersecurity, how to do it, what to look for. And it goes all the way through my, my pieces all around threat intelligence. Uh, we have some other folks talking about GRC. Um, so it's it's really it's a really informative quarterly uh, a piece that we do. And I think it's, it's a definite must read for every CISO, at least to help them figure out kind of how to keep their garrison up. Makes sense. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Chris. Pleasure to go on the rundown with you this week. I love doing this. So thank you. Appreciate it. All right, Gary. <laughs> Stay tuned next week. We'll be back with more threats and vulnerabilities. Thank you for tuning into The Threat Show. If you enjoyed the show, subscribe to us on YouTube, give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, and interact with us on Twitter at The Threat Show. Also, be sure to subscribe to Fletch's interactive newsletter and Trending Threats app to go deeper into the stories we discuss. Be sure to stay tuned to stay ahead of threats.